This is Voluminous, a listening books podcast for every kind of reader, but especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and this is the second of our two special 2020 episodes. Last week, we shared an interview with writer and comedian Adam Buxton. Definitely check that out if you haven't already. And this week, I'm joined by my colleagues Amy Flinders and Abigail Jaggers to talk about some of the books we've been turning to, or in some cases returning to, for comfort and company in what can feel like an isolating time. We'll end the show with a dastardly literary game of my own devising, which I hope you'll play along with at home. But for now, let's refresh our memories of who we are and what we do here. Amy, can you remind us all what you do at Listening Books? Yes, at Listening Books, I'm the copyright manager, which means I deal with all the contracts that we have with the various publishers that let us buy their books for our catalogue. And I buy all the books and I do little bits of marketing and things like that as well. So yeah, lots of different things. I love the idea that there is a job where literally you get paid to buy all the books. That yes, sounds like an amazing job. I get paid <laughs> to get given money to buy books. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty it's a pretty good job. I'm not gonna not gonna lie. <laughs> Amy, do you have your cat recording here with you? Uh, actually, just as you said that, my cat has started meowing outside the spare room door uh, where I'm sat recording this. So you might hear a few kind of uh, feline noises every now and again. I've shut her out, but I don't know if that's a bad idea because she might be curious and want to come in. But uh, yeah, for the minute, she's not here, but but that might change. And you might hear her, okay. so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Abby, can you remind us all what you do at Listening Books? Yeah, um, so my official title is Membership and Marketing Assistant, but that basically means I do lots and lots of different marketing bits, mostly with digital. So I'm on the social media. If you've ever sent us a message on social media, it's me responding um, and all sort of digital marketing things along that line. And have you got your dog Alfie recording with you today? Well, I have also shut him out because, as we all know, he's a very old man now. He's 14. Um, and even when he's lying down, he snores so loudly that he <laughs> interrupts me. Um, and I decided that as we are trying to record a podcast today, I thought that would it would be best to shut him outside for now. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to give listeners any ideas with the snoring, you know. Um, we want to keep everybody <laughs> awake here. <laughs> yeah, that's not a great noise to have on a podcast, is it? <laughs> I would usually have my cat April in the basket next to me here in my little home office. Um, but she saw me setting up the mic and all this like activity surrounding getting ready for the recording and she decided to bail. So um, <laughs> very sensible cat. Yes. So as you can hear, um, we're all recording remotely with whatever equipment we happen to have at home. So thank you, listeners, for forgiving any difference in the usual sound quality and any incidental noise that could occur from traffic or interrupting pets or whatever. Now, some of us have had some extra time because of furlough, but I think all three of us have at least had extra time that we weren't commuting or participating in the social activities that we'd normally be doing. Did either of you find that you were using that extra time to read more? Um, <laughs> I wish I could say, yes, I have read the complete works of Shakespeare. But um, I think uh, I, I did read ever so slightly more. I think maybe I read like one extra book than I would have done had there not been a, a raging pandemic. Um, but I, I think the thing is that in... Um, in more normal life, I do obviously uh, a lot of commuting and I listen to quite a lot of audiobooks that way. So the fact that I wasn't out and about so much meant that um, I didn't listen to as much audio stuff. Uh, and I, I maybe read like a little bit extra print wise, but yeah, definitely didn't get to listen to as much audiobooks or podcasts or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I guess it may be balanced out to kind of just me consuming the same amount as I normally would really. Okay. Um, that's, that's fair enough. I think that's good going, actually. How about you, Abby? 
Um, I actually found it very difficult to read at the beginning of lockdown. I had completely the opposite experience. Um, I think like a lot of people around sort of February and March, I was very anxious uh, all the time. We were still coming into the office, but very irregularly um, until the lockdown. And I couldn't really concentrate on anything at all. (laughs) Um, I would pick up a print book and read maybe a page or two and then just put it down um, because I just couldn't get into it at all. Um, And audio books really came in for me there I was able to just sort of listen while I was doing something that I find quite calming like I got really into cross stitch um, and I was able to just put an audiobook on and relax and listen which really helped me actually during the lockdown. Yeah I also found it really hard to settle into reading for a while I gotta say Um, and it's funny I think the way people respond to this differently because I actually think my husband was completely the opposite and whereas he'd normally read um, a bit of nonfiction, but at a a more, I'd say, dignified pace than the way I usually rattle through (laughs) fiction. (laughs) Um, He switched to to reading fiction and he was reading all of these amazing novels that I had bought for myself to read that I just couldn't make myself settle into. And he was just flying through them. It was very unusual behavior for both him and me. Um, So anyway, I think it's different. I think it's interesting how differently it's affected everyone's reading lives. I'm curious, Abby, since you were a little bit like me um, in finding it difficult to to settle down into into reading, was there a specific book or or genre that kind of brought you out of that initial slump or something that you were able to turn to when when nothing else seemed appealing? Um, so yes, um, I went straight for the 19th century, which I didn't think that I would do. Um, I read three Jane Austen books and a Georgette Heyer. <laughs> uh, I just, all in a row. Um, apparently I just dive into Regency romance when I need comfort. Um, I'm not sure why they're so comforting. They're set during the Napoleonic Wars. Quite a lot of stuff is happening. Um, but the main sort of gist of the stories is basically that they're just concerned about their day-to-day lives and falling in love. Um, and they're just concerned about finding a good husband, uh, you know, receiving a letter from their sister. And I think a lot of relatable can, really. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> what it, I, I really felt like I was relating quite hard because obviously, as I said, I turned into a 19th century lady and got really into cross stitch. Um, and I, <laughs> I think, you know, despite there being a pandemic happening um, and everything was so different, um, we were just trying to live our lives out day by day and just try and get through everything and just try and keep normal relationships going. And I just felt quite, you know, knowing that that was the background to when Austin was writing um, it. I don't know, I just found it quite relatable and quite comforting to listen about. Um, And I think the other thing that really drew to me is that I think I forget how funny Austin is um, when I sort of go away from it a bit. I think of it as sort of just this calm Regency romance, 19th century, I can jump into it. It's all, you know, novel of manners and things. Um, But actually I was listening to Persuasion uh, and I actually had to pause the audiobook because I was just in hysterics about this one line (laughs) that I'm just going to read out to you because I I think it's my favourite line in any Jane Austen, uh, which is, he had, in fact, though his sisters were now doing all they could for him by calling him Poor Richard, been nothing more than a thick-headed, unfeeling, unprofitable Dick Musgrove, who had never done anything to entitle himself to more than the abbreviation of his name, living or dead. And I just think, who expects a duck joke in Jane Austen? (laughs) And there it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sick burn as well. <laughs> yeah. I just think she's full of the sick burns. Um, and I have to say that when I was listening to it, I fully was not expecting that and just had just absolutely lost my mind with laughing over it, which was really nice. <laughs> yeah, I also turned to some period fiction, um, but not exactly the same ones. So it turns out I needed some familiar but sober reading. I, I don't think I was quite looking for the same laugh out loud moments at the time. Um, so I turned to classics that I'd already read, like, um, well, first it was Jane Eyre, which actually was a much more fun read than I anticipated. But I think that was because I was um, live texting Abby my reactions um, <laughs> because it was way more racist and classist than I remembered. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Abby, you are quite the expert on Jane Eyre. Remind us wh- how you're an expert on Jane Eyre. I wouldn't say expert, um, <laughs> but I've 
probably read it a lot because uh, I wrote a master's dissertation about how we've understood Jane Eyre over time through rewrites of Jane Eyre. Um, so not only have I read Jane Eyre about 1,200 times in my life, I've read a bunch of rewrites of it as well. So I'm quite familiar with it. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you just share with everyone the title of that dissertation, please? <laughs> Uh, the title of my dissertation was Reader, I Buried Him, The Afterlives of Jane and Bertha. <laughs> Reader, I Buried Him. I love that. That's my, that's my favorite dissertation title. But, but yeah, so I, I found that experience of, of sharing that reliving of Jane Eyre um, to be an uplifting part of it, just to, to, to be able to share in real time my reactions with somebody who knew w- what I was talking about. Yeah, I really like the idea of uh, of live texting your reactions to a book. I could just imagine you with like your book in one hand and in your phone in the other. <laughs> like, Abby, oh my gosh, chapter 17. <laughs> Amy, I think you were telling me before that um, that you also found a way to engage with others as you were reading. Yeah, so a couple of uh, my friends and I, we started uh, an online Zoom book club uh which uh yeah I'd never been part of a of a book club before it was something I'd always wanted to try but you know you just don't get the time to to do these things do you uh but we uh yeah so we did it over zoom and we read I listened to the audiobook actually of An American Marriage by uh Tayari Jones Tayari Jones yeah Yeah. it's a really good book yeah Uh, It was the Women's Prize winner I think last year wasn't it oh that sounds right um yeah yes so yeah, we read An American Marriage, uh, or rather I listened to the, the audiobook, uh, which I thought was uh, was really good. Um, and then we I read uh, The Night Tiger by Yang Zichu as well. Um, yeah, which was, uh, had a lot going on in it and uh, was sort of like a mystery, but like folklore as well. It was, yeah, it was really good. Um, and it was, yeah, I, I know uh, people were using lockdown to try out lots of different stuff. So it was nice to do to do a book club because I've not tried that out before. So yeah, it was, it was fun. Would you do a, a real live book club now that you've experienced an online one? Uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, you know, it's one of those things where like you think it's, it's just very sort of like time dependent. <laughs> if I had like, yeah, all the time in the world, I would definitely do a book club again. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was good. And it's nice because like, other than at work where sometimes we talk about the books that we that we get in and stuff I don't really have like that much opportunity to really talk about books in depth you know Mm. um and like I don't know when we were chatting a lot about about those books it kind of just reminded me of like being in a a seminar at uni but but in more of a fun way (laughs) uh... (laughs) I think that's really interesting um that you use lockdown to read something new and try out different things um, because all I wanted was comfort um, and like I said along with rereading all of the Jane Austen I also reread my favourite Georgette Heyer novel um, which is The Grand Sophie um, and I think this is for quite a similar reason um, to all of the other Jane Austens they're just really comfortably escapist um, and it gave my mind permission to spend some time not thinking about everything um, which I think is probably quite a similar thing to what you were doing with something new, but just in a different way? Well, I find this really interesting because I feel like what I, what I started doing was some sort of synthesis of this. So I wasn't looking for escape necessarily. I I, I do sometimes read for escape, but I was, I was returning to the sort of familiarity of, of things that I reread, but I was really craving um, something to wrestle with that, felt like it mattered. Um, and, and so this led me, after I read a piece about Middlemarch, this led me to, to reread that great big old classic. Uh, I had the time, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, but I, I think for a lot of people, you know, the restrictions of the pandemic have prompted some reflection on, well, what's truly important to us? Um, and so I found myself turning or, or returning really to Middlemarch, which is also concerned with what it is to live a life of goodness and fulfillment. Um, and it it wrestles with these ideas of vocation and ambition, the distance between our best intentions and reality. And it does all this earnestly, as you might expect, but also with enormous humor. Um, there's so much in it that I was actually reading it twice. I was listening to the audiobook um, and then read at night when I went to bed, sort of catching up with what 
what I had listened to during the day. And then again, because I craved that ability to react to it with somebody else who also knew it, I roped a friend into reading it as well. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I really did kind of put the pressure on. <laughs> you tried very hard with me as well, but I was I did. You were not it. having it. You were like, nope, going on to Jane Austen. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I guess I was looking for that, uh, for, for a mixture of comfort as in regards to the familiarity of the story, but also the challenge of the ideas that it was presenting. So, yeah, I mean, while I didn't actually listen to Middlemarch, even though you tried to persuade me, I did listen to Persuasion, uh, which was also narrated by Juliet Stevenson, who I think you said narrates Middlemarch. Yeah. Um, And I do think she does have this wonderfully relaxing, it's like a BBC Radio 4 voice. I don't really know how else to explain it apart from that. It's just got this amazing cadence to it where she just speaks so well um and I think she was definitely born to read the classics because of that voice because she just does it really really well um so yeah I can't believe I'm about to admit this but one of the strangest things about me is that when I can't sleep I do listen to the shipping forecast on Radio 4 (laughs) um and Juliet Stevenson she has that same voice style when she's talking it just goes da 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 and it's just (laughs) lovely and it's so perfect and it just It just makes me relax just immediately. So if you're looking for a classic, definitely get one read by her. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent recommendation. Um, What about you, Amy? You said you actually read a little more than usual, a little more than usual. Um, What sorts of books? A little, very little, but still better than better than we were doing. Um, What sorts of books really came through for you? Um, Did you find yourself returning to any old friends like Abby and I did? Uh, well, I'm not really one uh, for returning to books that I've already read. Uh, I do like reading classics, but I, I don't tend to reread them. I'm very much like, OK, I've read this really long, difficult classic now. I never have to read it again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's more my attitude. Not that I don't enjoy it, but, you know, there is like a certain level of like dedication when you're like plowing through like a, yeah, a, a old kind of like 500 page novel. Uh, but um, yeah, and I don't really get into series either or read lots of books that are by the same author and I'm sounding now that I don't even really like reading I do (laughs) Uh, (laughs) there's nothing wrong with not liking reading but I I do like reading Um, I think I just try it takes me so long to get through a book I think I just try and read lots of different things so I don't try I don't really get stuck into like one series usually um, because of that reason but saying that during lockdown, I did return to a series that I had started a long time ago and never and never got around to finishing, which is the Adrian Mole series by Sue Townsend. Um, and it is a uh, it's I find it very comforting um, because over the the seven books of the series, you sort of really feel like you get to know uh Adrian's family and all the characters and like you have like affection for even the more sort of grumpy cantankerous ones like Adrian's dad or whatever you feel like you know them all and like you're part of the family even though um you probably really wouldn't want to be part of that family um (laughs) but uh yeah it's a lot of fun um and you know she's really good at mixing sort of like the kind of uh really silly funny embarrassing parts of Adrian's life with the kind of um political drop back of the kind of world that he's um living in uh and um even though I didn't really come to the series until I was a bit older um I kind of uh, I still find it quite nostalgic and nostalgia is always comforting really isn't it um and I think it's kind of for the same reasons as you were saying Abby for um like when you were uh reading the Jane Austen novels uh that it's sort of like people just dealing with their own lives when they've got kind of like all this other kind of historical stuff going on in the background. So like with the Adrian Mulbus, it's all kind of more recent history, obviously. And it was interesting because the last ones that I've just read, it was recent history that I can actually remember. So uh, in the last couple of books, it's all sort of like the Iraq war and everything like that. And in the earlier novels, it's like set against like um, uh, set within Thatcher's Britain. Um, So obviously like it's not particularly like rosy climate that the backgrounds are set, uh, the books are set to, but it's, yeah, there's just something quite encouraging about like a, a really hilariously disastrous family just getting on with things when they've got all this other kind of like serious stuff going on in the world, and which is kind of what everyone is doing now. So yeah, I think that's why I found it quite 
comforting and also you can take comfort in the fact that your life probably isn't as awful or embarrassing as Adrian's so (laughs) yeah (laughs) um and yeah it's probably the only series of books that I've read in full I don't think I've read seven other books in any other series so yeah Hmm. that's good (laughs) I love the uh the comfort by contrast (laughs) that's a good one (laughs) um yeah (laughs) (laughs) Now, we also asked some of you on social media to chime in with books you turn to for comfort in difficult times. And here's what you said. Uh, So Maddie on Facebook, along with many others, I'm sure, said Harry Potter is my go to comfort read. They're almost like my audio comfort blanket helped me through many difficult moments this year, which I really liked because I really like the phrase audio comfort blanket. Oh, nice. Yeah, that does. Mm. That's evocative. Yeah. Oh, you just imagine being sort of like, yeah. Uh, Enveloped. Kind of cuddling up with waves of sound. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just warm waves of sound. So relaxing. So Kate on Facebook said, uh, similar to Abby, Georgia Heyer, uh, and also Agatha Christie, read by Hugh Fraser. Um, and in our last Connect, actually, we interviewed Hugh Fraser. Uh, our colleague Claire interviewed Hugh Fraser. So if you're a fan of uh, his readings of the Agatha Christie books, then you should go and check that out. Sarah on Twitter um, said, for comfort, I always go to Agatha Christie. Or for a bit of comedy, I dip into the Alan Partridge book, I Partridge, We Need to Talk About Alan. I also loved Penelope Fitzgerald's Human Voices earlier this year. It is set in the BBC during World War II, and the writing is beautiful. Ooh. Uh, Amy on Facebook, not our Amy who's sitting here right now. Uh, Anna of Green Gables always makes me feel better. You can't help but smile. And I also turn to Harry Potter when things are bad. So that's another vote for Harry Potter there. Yeah. Well, and I'll add a vote for Anne of Green Gables, which I recently returned to as well. Um, And it's because I keep thinking about this one image from the book when um, Ella Montgomery first introduces us to Anne. Um, She's the little redheaded orphan who's waiting at the station to be collected by her new family. And this is how she's described. She was sitting there waiting for something or somebody. And since sitting and waiting was the only thing to do just then, she sat and waited with all her might and main. And it goes on to describe how she uses her imagination while she's sitting and waiting. But um, I think I was really struck by how, with that simple description, uh, Montgomery changes something inherently, or what's usually considered inherently passive, into a, a deliberate and active state of being. Um, And I just found that a bit inspiring for this moment that we're in where we're just asked to sit and wait. (laughs) Well, those of us who aren't providing essential services, but you know, the rest of us, like the the best thing that we can do is to sit and wait and uh, to turn that into an active thing. I don't know. I think that's, I think that's worth uh, reflecting on and, and um, considering how we might take it take on a more active stance in that uh responsibility i've never read anna green gables but that has just sold it to me i think i'm definitely really? yeah. Read it. <laughs> I'm not, yeah i've not read it either but i felt like i know a lot about that character now just from that one yeah. sentence oh like, yeah <laughs> um it's just about time for our game but first let's hear from some very special friends about the books they've found comforting this year Hello, Listening Books. This is Jenny Eclair, and I'm looking back, thinking about all the books I've read, or rather listened to, because I'm a big audio fan, um, over 2020 during lockdown one and lockdown two. And I think the most comforting book that I listened to was Marion Keyes's Grown Ups. Uh, if you haven't listened to it or read it, do yourself a favour and treat yourself to it because it really is a slice of fruit cake. It's a warm cuddle. It's a hot water bottle on your toes in the middle of a very cold night. Lockdown was a weird thing for me because I sort of was used to being out and about like a lot of people. I was on the road every day working with schools and colleges and prisons and all sorts um, with literacy projects. So um, losing that, it took me a while to get my sort of head around that. And then my little girl who's seven was at home. So I sort of lost the the reading thing and I wasn't writing it felt a bit like I was sort of uh I was going stale so I spent a lot of time with my little girl rereading the Roald Dahl collection we read every single book um children's book the Roald Dahl has ever written um and that 
is the thing that got me back into it. Um, but the book I would turn to, my biggest comfort read, other than Sue Townsend's books, um, was 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I'd probably read it 14 times in my life. And I sat down one evening, um, opened it, um, and it's a book that never fails to please. It never fails to show me new layers of depth and understanding. I listened to Hammett by Maggie Farrell, which I adored and thought was just beautifully written. And the other one that I absolutely loved was Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid. But there are staples in amongst all of them, which I listen to time and time again. Uh, Wind in the Willows, um, which I love listening to. That's a real comfort read. And um, P.G. Woodhouse, I, I think he's a complete genius. Um, it all looks like such sleight of hand, and yet the magic of those words is quite complicated and wonderful. I love story. Thank you very much to our Listening Books ambassadors, authors Jenny Eclair, Bally Rye, and Sally Gardner for telling us about the books that have kept you company lately. Um, it is time now to play our game, and those of you playing along at home, if you do better than these two, tell us about it. Seriously, rub it in. Yes, Jess will love it. <laughs> <laughs> we won't, but Jess will take great pleasure in it. <laughs> Abby, where do they find us on social media? It's really easy to find us. Uh, on Twitter, we're at Listening Books and the same on Instagram. And if you search for Listening Books on Facebook, we're the first ones that pop up. Excellent. Now, Abby and Amy, I asked you to find something that would serve as your unique buzzer for this game. <laughs> Amy, what have you found? <laughs> I'm not sure how unique uh, us both are, <laughs> but uh, because I am an insane cat lady, I of course have a cat toy to hand at any point. So I've got a little ball with a bell in it. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> And okay. Abby, what noisemaker have you got? <laughs> uh, so listeners may know from about this time last year that I become the Christmas fairy from about November the 1st all the way through into January. So I have a Christmas jumper that has jingle bells on it and it goes like this. How remarkably different. <laughs> <laughs> But it's okay. I can see you, um, so I will. I will let everyone know who has jingled in. <laughs> okay. Does everyone have a pen and paper? You don't necessarily need it, but you might find it helpful. Yes. Great. Here's how we're going to play. There are only three questions, but each of these questions requires you to solve three more clues to arrive at the answer. Ooh. Now, each question is worth a total of five points, two for the actual answer and an additional point for solving each clue. So if you get the answer, but not every clue, your opponent can pick up some points. So only Ooh. buzz in when you think you know the answer to the question. Does that sound clear? Yeah. So we oh. can buzz in before we've gone through all the clues. Is that what you're saying? You can if you think you know the answer. Yes. But okay, be aware right. that if you can't solve all the clues that your opponent can get points for guessing them. We'll get as well. Okay. I think I'm it in. will become clear yes. as I give the questions. And if it isn't, then let me know. All right. First question. What links these three titles? Okay. Your first clue is the 1999 novel by Joanne Harris about a young woman and her daughter arriving in a French village to sell chocolates during Lent. The second clue is the 1939 novel by John Steinbeck about migrant farm workers during the Great Depression. And the third clue is the 2001 novel by Jan Martel about a boy in a boat with a tiger. Oh! Yes, Abby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, is the answer food? Yes. Yay! Yes. Yeah. And do I need to give you all of the clues as well? Yes. If you want the full five points, you, yeah, you uh, Obviously. Yeah. I mean, I'm very competitive. <laughs> so the first question is Chocolat, is the novel by Joan Harris. Mm -hmm. The second question is, I think, The Grapes of Wrath. Yes. And the third novel is The Life of Pi, but not spelt. Pie right. as in eating uh, yes. pie. I was overthinking it because pie isn't pie. So I was like, it's, but it's the, it's, it's short for piscine. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, food, food, swimming pool. <laughs> I was a little worried that somebody would be a little too literal minded about that. <laughs> 
Yes, and I was that person. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Just going to well write done, down Abby. five points here. There we go. Five yeah. points for Abby. She doesn't trust my scorekeeping. <laughs> No, I'm just Which very is wise. <laughs> so okay. like, do I get points for getting the clues or not? No, I'm sorry. It's only because, Abby. Oh, okay. Yeah, only Abby Man. gets those points. It's okay. You've got a chance for the next one. <laughs> okay. For the second one, it'll be fairly clear what links all three, but I want to know which is the odd one out. Your three clues are the titles as if generated by a thesaurus. So, for example, to murder a mimicking avian would be to kill a mockingbird. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So those are that's how your clues are going to be. All right. So your (laughs) first clue, ego and bias. Ego and bias. Okay. second clue, conflict and concord. Conflict and concord. And the third clue is felony and retribution. Felony and retribution. Oh yes, Amy. Uh is it the the first one that I've went out? Yes, it is. And can cool. you tell me the titles? Can you talk me through each of the clues, what their titles are? Uh so B is uh War and Peace. Yes. And C is crime and punishment. Yes. Oh, yes, of course it so is. So to me, it sounded like A would be the odd one out, but I don't know what A is. <laughs> <laughs> so A is A is pride and prejudice, right? Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so Abby now has six points and Amy has four. Because you got two okay. points for answering the question and another two yeah. for each of the clues that you got. Okay. Okay. Third and last question. And I made it a maths question. Oh, oh no. It's easy. Um, each of these clues point to a title containing a number. I want you to tell me the sum of the numbers. That's all. Okay. 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 Just add them up. All right. Ready? Yeah. First mm-hmm. clue Joseph Heller's satirical war novel that coined a phrase describing a paradoxical rule. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Second clue. The Magic Realist Classic by Gabriel Garcia Marquez that chronicles the lives of the Buendia family. Yep. Also, that accent was Do you need me to say that again, Amy? (laughs) Yeah. Can you just say it again? (laughs) I'll take the accent off the author's name. Yeah, can you just do it? Your usual. (laughs) That is my usual. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, The Magic Realist Classic by Gabriel Garcia Marquez that chronicles the lives of the Buendia family. All right, and the third one, Shakespeare's romantic comedy about the shipwrecked twins, Viola and Sebastian, probably written as entertainment for the close of the Christmas season. All right. Oh, hey. (laughs) (laughs) I think think Abby got in there first. Abby was just too excited about it. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Is the answer of all of them added together 144? Say it again. 144, 144. It is not, I'm afraid. Amy, did you have a different number? Uh, Yeah, completely different. I don't really know what the the Gabriel Garcia Marquez one is. (laughs) (laughs) So... I just guessed, I said, has that got a number one in it? So I put 35. (laughs) Ah, okay. Isn't it a hundred years of solitude? It is. Oh, hundred. Sorry. Yes. Then. It is. Okay. So it's a hundred years of solitude. And the top one is catch twenty-two. It's one hundred and thirty-four. Yes. Amy's got it. Oh yeah. I just can't count. If I only remembered it was a hundred, not one. One year of solitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be very appropriate for right now, wouldn't it? Just be a single now, year yeah. of solitude. <laughs> so the answer is. 134, 134. And Amy, you gave us the correct answer. Do you want to talk us through the clues? Uh, so the first one was Catch 22. Yes. And the third one was 12, 12th Night. Yes, that's right. Yes. And then the middle one, not one year of solitude, as I thought. It was <laughs> 100 years of solitude. So add that all together. Yes. Yeah, so I gave 
Amy the points for both the answer and two of the clues. And then I gave Abby the point for 100 Years of Solitude. And that means that Amy has just barely won Uh, with with eight points to Abby's seven. Uh, (laughs) Curse my lack of ability to add. (laughs) Very respectable scores, though. (laughs) Well, congratulations, Amy. I'm sorry to say that the only prize that you get is the glory. Um, I'll and take it. I go do a victory jingle. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent jingling, everybody. <laughs> That is all for today's podcast. We would love to hear what books have been good company for you in this season. Find us on Twitter or Instagram at Listening Books. You can hashtag Voluminous if you're confident in your spelling. Or find us on Facebook where we're Listening Books 12. Thanks so much for listening. And from all of us at Listening Books, may your books be the best kind of company this winter. Funny, wise, entertaining. I hope you have a lovely festive season full of lots of books and biscuits and chocolate. I wish you a happy festive period full of audio comfort blankets and an excellent year going forward. Voluminous is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity providing audiobooks for over 100,000 members who have a disability or illness that impacts their ability to read the printed word. If that sounds like you or someone you know, you can find out how to access our more than 9,000 titles, including the ones we discussed today, by heading to www.listening-books.org.uk.